French elementary school children are having to get used to wearing masks. I don't like it because I can't breathe with the mask and the glasses. It's not the first time there's been a mask requirement, but infection rates are climbing, especially among children. We should never have taken them off. It would have avoided giving them a false sense of joy. The mask is compulsory. Experts agree masks offer protection against infection. Many coronavirus cases could be avoided if people covered their mouth and nose. And that's a lesson school kids in France are learning. Hi, I'm Ben Fazulan. With winter here, mandatory masks are also a hot debate in the UK. More than 140,000 people have died of COVID-19 there, the highest death toll of any European country. The face mask, the most visible symbol of England's restrictions-free approach to COVID. England has one of the highest case rates in Europe, yet there's no legal obligation to wear a mask on public transport and most indoor areas. It's an approach that sets it apart from the rest of the UK and much of Western Europe. I always put mine on on the train and going into shops and I'd prefer it if other people did and there seem to be a lot of people, especially on the trains nowadays, that, that don't. You know, I work on public transport so I think it should be on. We should be wearing them. But obviously powers that be have decided it's down to the individual. Nobody should be forced to do something within a private matter and health obviously is a private matter. It's currently up to the individual to decide whether they'd like to wear a mask. And yet in one recent survey, the public said they'd rather be told. 81% of people said they'd like to see mandatory mask wearing enforceable on public transport. So why isn't it? Well, that goes to the heart of government. The divide over masks is as clear in Parliament as it is in public, with more masks on the opposition benches than among the governing Conservative Party. The Prime Minister himself came under fire this week after he was pictured visiting a hospital at points without a mask. And accusations that the government is setting a bad example are growing louder. We've had record numbers of infections in Parliament, including recently uh, the leader of the opposition, uh, Keir Starmer. So I think it's very irresponsible and arrogant of the mainly Conservative MPs. They're setting a very bad example uh, to the public. They're setting a very bad example to the rest of the people in Parliament. The government says it's focusing its efforts on its vaccine and booster jab campaign. And while cases are high, hospitalizations and deaths are considerably lower than previous waves. But with fatalities in the UK averaging over 150 a day, the government's under pressure to bring back masks and social distancing. It is simply unacceptable to have the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every two or three days in terms of the number of deaths. So we cannot rely on this vaccine only strategy. Face coverings work. We can see that the countries that use them have much lower rates than we have. The government is yet to rule out a return of mandatory masks. And as we enter into winter, it will be up to ministers to decide if and when high case numbers become too high. But after months of being told masks aren't legally required, will the public and the politicians be persuaded to put them back on? And let's get the view on masks from here in Germany, from Ulrich Pöschel from the Max Planck Institute. How much protection do masks really give you if we compare, say, the FFP2 and 3 masks? Well, FFP2 masks are certified to reduce the particle output and intake by 95%, and FFP3 are certified to 99%. Um, and that means if it works well, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, then the FFP2 mask can reduce the risk of infection by a factor of 20, and the FFP3 mask can reduce it by a factor of 100 for the individual. And if everybody masks up, then you have to actually multiply these numbers. So then you get to numbers of uh, 400 for FFP2 masks and uh, 10,000 uh, for FFP3 masks. So these are enormous efficiencies. But what I would like to point out is that the full benefit of these very good masks you get only if your mask really sits and seals tightly. And for this purpose, it's really important that they have such a rubber 
uh, such a rubber sealing over the nose because otherwise the leakages are usually what determine the practical uh, efficiency of masks. What about other drawbacks like bacteria buildup, a false sense of security, uh, as we heard from that French woman earlier, a false sense of joy for those kids? Well, I, I don't think that these uh, arguments are particularly valid. I think every mask is better than no mask. Um, and actually, when, you, when, when masks get bad, you usually really see it or smell it. So I think in practice, um, uh, I don't think that there is um, uh, any downside to masks when they are properly used. And I think it's a really important tool to use uh, one should just be aware that the full benefit is really only reached when you use them fully according to instructions and when they sit really tightly sealed. And are you talking about the full benefit for those wearing the masks or others around you? Actually, for both sides. So masks always protect both sides. They protect the others from uh, both large uh, droplets that, that we exhale so that go by spraying on a short distance. Uh, and that goes both ways. I protect the others and myself. And the same goes actually also for those aerosol particles, which are in practice just smaller spray uh, droplets. So these are below 0 0.1 nanometers. We talk of aerosols for larger droplets. Uh, it's sort of ballistic droplets that fly like this. And for both of these masks are good. The large droplets, even simple masks, can reduce with an efficiency close to 100 percent. Actually, even a scarf helps along against the big uh, droplets. But uh, for the smaller droplets, for the aerosols, we really need good masks. So a surgical mask is the minimum, but it's much better to use FFP2 or FFP3. And what about the most useful applications for the various masks? Can you run us through some of them? Well, I would say definitely what we heard before uh, in the trailer is uh, in public transport or also in shops, etc. I think masks uh, should be worn uh, by all. And then I think in general, in indoor settings, uh, I would recommend masks whenever people mix uh, with people from outside their household. But actually also in outdoor environments, um, it is useful to wear masks when you are close by other people. So within about one to two meters, you also do have the risk of droplet uh, infection. That means these larger droplets that we all exhale, they can still hit other people also in the outside environment. And a single one of those droplets, about one millimeter in size or 0.1, a single one of those can lead to an infection with a very high probability when it comes from an infected person. And again, uh, against these masks, uh, against these droplets, uh, masks are very efficient and these droplets also lead to infections in the outside environment. So it's not only indoors, just indoors, mm -hmm. it's even more urgent to use the masks. And just really briefly, Ulrich, uh, as we've said time and again on this show, it's not just masks that we should be relying on, should we? No, absolutely not. I think vaccination is certainly the thing that I would take first. And of course, I'm also fully vaccinated. But then the second best thing is already the mask. And in addition to the mask, it's always good to ventilate rooms when you're inside. Ulrich Pöschel from the Max Planck Institute. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Welcome. Thank you. OK, time for a viewer question about the length of immunity provided by vaccines. Here's Derek Williams. What do we know about how long immunity with vaccines will last? This is another million dollar question that'll just take a lot more time to answer and answers will vary from vaccine to vaccine. But um, here's what we know at the moment. A number of studies now support the conclusion that protection against COVID-19 after vaccination, with basically all of the vaccines approved by the WHO, that it wanes in the following six months. Um, although messenger RNA vaccines in particular have remained pretty effective at preventing hospitalization in recipients. 
Uh, the fact that growing numbers of people are experiencing breakthrough infections, however, even if most are not getting severely ill, is behind new drives in a number of countries that are now authorizing and encouraging booster doses half a year after the initial vaccination, um, especially for vulnerable groups like the elderly and the immunocompromised. So what does that mean for the future? Well, a few different scenarios are possible now that the idea of boosting is gaining widespread acceptance. One is that like with a few other vaccines, such as the ones against hepatitis B, a third dose of a COVID-19 vaccine could do the trick and create powerful, longer lasting immunity. Um, some experts are hopeful that that will prove to be the case. Uh, we're still gathering data on whether uh, mix and match approaches make sense. So the idea of boosting with a different type of vaccine than the original, that might gain more traction as we move forward. Um, plenty of other experts, however, are predicting that in the future, annual updated shots could be necessary, similar to the situation that we have with flu shots. But as I said, um, that's something that won't really become clear for at least another year or two.